Your Excellencies, Religious Freedom Institute's Vice President for Public Policy and Director of Center for Religious Freedom Education, Mr. David Trimble, Senior advi Foreign Advisor for the President of the Kurdistan Region, Mr. Falah Mustafa, Chief Scientific Advisor for the President of Kurdistan Region, Professor Sirwan Baban, Foreign Affairs Advisor for the President of Kurdistan Region, Mr. Niaz Barzani, the head of the Independent Human Rights Commission Kurdistan of Kurdistan Region, Dr. Munayako, Deputy Minister of Endowment and Religious Affairs, Mr. Zinedine Mouloud, President of Koya University, Professor Dr. Wali Hamad, respected government officials, representatives of various religious and ethnic minorities, national and international humanitarian agencies, University academics, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of the Catholic University in Erbil and Koya University, it's my distinct honor and high privilege to welcome you all to the opening ceremony of the first international conference on religion and social peace, challenges and prospects, ICRSP 2022. Organized by the Catholic University in Erbil in collaboration with Koya University and with a gener generous sponsor and fund of the Religious Freedom Institute. First, let us all stand for a moment in silence for the souls of our brave martyrs and heroes. Thank you very much. For the ones who are in need of translation, for Arabic translation, and for the ones who have um, the device, please uh, log into channel one. And for Kurdish translation, log into channel two. For English translation, if the speaker is Kurdish, channel two, and if the speaker is Arabic, channel one. And now, to open the event, I would like to welcome the conference chair, Professor Dr. Wali Hamad, the president of Koya University, to the podium. Dr. Wali. بناوی خواهی گوره و مهربان اما دبوانی خوشویست میوانانی برایس تجرانی بجداری کنفرانس بناوی هر دو زنکو انجمنی هر دو زنکو بخیراتینی گرم تانکم و خوشحال این امرو همومان به یکوا لکنفرانسی چی گرنجی هاو بشی نیو دولتی لنوان هر دو زنکو کو بوینه تا و ام کارا هاو بشا گرنجیو تایبت مندی خوی هیا للاک یکم کارو نوبری کاری زانستی نوان هر دو زنکو یا و للاک چی تر نو نشانو دروش می کنفرانس کا زور هستیارو جگای بایخا برزان به یک وجیان لنوان مروفکان لسر گوی زوی بگشتیو رشحلاتی ناوراستو عراقو حرم کردستانیش بتای بتی جگای قصه لسر کردنو حلسنگان دنو ترامانا و اشتی کملایتی مایی خیرو پشکوتنو خوشی بینینی مروکان لجیان و نبه 
دجا آشتیو حس کردن ل آشوبو نکوچی درس کردنیش میلو برنامه کسانی که نبین. بالا با امی اهل زانست و اکادمی دب برنگاری امجوره آلنگاریو عقلیتان ببینوا که وعده بنه کاری شوان دنی جانو تقدیری آشتیو به یک وجیانه خدای مزن که خلق نری همومانه مروی لشت هر پیروز کند ناوا و درس کردو هر بوی هر کاری چی نمروانه او وستانوی برانبر هزی خوای مزنو بنیات نری ام دنیا و هموش ما نو دزانین هر خیر و چاکا لکو تایی دا سرکوی بلام لوانه من دوبونو حولی بوی کنابه آشتی خوازان پشو کرد بن خوشکو برایانی خوشویست مروفکان هر رنگو زمانو آینیک بن ده بی ریز لبرام برکانیان بگیرن او چه جای اوی اما لم حریما و لم ناوچه یا بیک و دجین هر ناکوچیو دو برکیک آسودهی همو من ده خاتمه ترسی بالی گرین آین لنوان مروفکانو خدا دا بی بلام کس آزاد یکانو پیروز یکانی اوی تر پیشل نکا و نا دیده نگره آزادی به معنی او نیا ریز لبران برکت نگری بل کتو هر اونده آزادی تا و کو او سنوری که آزادی بران برکت پیشل نکیو دستی بونه بی به پیتوانو ها تو ده بیتا کسی چی تک درو دجا آشتیو آزادیو به یک وجیان گرنگا که ایمی اکادیمی تو جرکانی بواری کمالایتی آین یاسا درو ناسی پیوندیکان به جدی بین میدانی انبابتا چون که نبی شرم بکین میجومان پریتی للا پری رشو پیشل کاریو پیشل کدینی مافی اکتر بوی نابی چی تر ام بابتا بو خل چی تر خل چی سیاسی توی جرکانی ناو سیاستو کمل لیب گرین دو بی ببلگوه و با دکومنت آرگومنت و با آرگومنتی زنستی خیرو بیری آشتیو بی کوجیانیان پی بسلمینین و بوب سلمنی اتر دور پرزی بسا دبی بکاری خرابو بیری خرابو زرری تون رویل کمال قبلین بو استن و رنشاندرو هاو کاری چاک کارو خیر خوازو اشتی خوازم بین توی جرانی بجدار بوی ام کنفرانسا هیوا دارم به توی جینه و کانتان و گفتگوی دو روزه کنفرانس هوکاری کردنوی درگاه چی خیر و خوشی و آشتی کمالایتی بن و آستو ناورو چی توی جینه و کانتان هنده کاری گر بی که او بیرو عقلیتانی دجا آشتین بخوایان دا بچنوا و قناعت بخوایان بینن که ام هره مو ام نوچه یا و مروفایتی بگشتی لقازان زیتی که ای تر تندرو نبین و او بزانین که همو راستی کان تنها لای منین بلکو بیکو تواوکاری ام کومل گای لکو تایده سپاسی تواوی لجنکانی کنفرانس دکم لهر دو زنکوی کویو زنکوی کاثولیچی هولیر سپاسی همو آنه دکم که هاو کاری سرخستنی کنفرانس کن دست خوشی لتوی جرانو همو آنه دکین 
که هنیان داین بو ام کاره هاو بشا هوا خوازم کاری ترو چالاچی تری زنستی هاو بش لنوان هر دو زن کدا هبل آین دا من دو بارا بخیراتینی همو لایک تانده کم ولی هر کمو کوریک بمان بورن و هوای سلامتیو تندرستیو آسودهی بو همو تانده خوازم بتایبتی بو امیوانانی که لدروی هرمی کردستان و هاتون هر براستی خوشحال تان کردوین و هان من دادن با اوی بردوان بین هر شادو سر برز بین سپس زور سپس دکتر بس با اوانی که پیوستی هم با ترجمه هیا با ورگران هیا با اوانی با زمانی کردی چنل دو دابنن با اوانی لوتاره کم نبدا تنگیشتن و للاشخاص اللي يريدون ترجمة من اللغة العربية خلي يروحون للشانل رقم واحد. Up next, please join me in welcoming the conference co-chair, president and vice chancellor of the Catholic University in Erbil, assistant professor Dr. Riyad Francis. Dr. Riyad. Good morning, um, a very good morning to um, everyone. Honorable Professor, Dr. Wali uh, Mahmoud Hamad, the President of Koya University, all distinguished um, guests, esteemed academics and researchers, a warm welcome to you at the Catholic University in Arbil, CUE, and we are greatly honored and truly delighted with your presence at this important scientific event. It's of a great pleasure and delight to hold our first international conference ever, jointly with esteemed Koya University under the slogan and uh, integrity vision to the promotion of coexistence on religion and social peace, challenges and prospects. At the campus of our university and that of Koya University, in our beloved Kurdistan region of Iraq. This conference is a fruitful outcome of enormous efforts, numerous meetings, and wonderful collaboration with our academic colleagues from Koya University, coupled with tireless follow-up by respected members of the organizing committee, scientific committee, and support, supportive members of the staff from both universities. We are almost entirely confident that we were right and successful in choosing the theme of this conference with all its exciting topics, as it has attracted the interest of a wide range of academics, scholars, and respected religion, religious leaders. We appreciate highly the positive response of a fairly good number of academics figures, nationally and internationally, whether as keynote speakers or as participants with research papers, namely from Germany, France, UK, and USA. It's worth mentioning that this conference is taking place amid serious waves of destructive extremism, which had spread in a number of countries, mainly in the, in the Middle East and Africa, and continues to exist in a sig significant number of spots around the world. Such extremism tries, unfortunately, to eliminate others and to repeal coexistence accompanied by the lack of respect to the value of life and humanity in a drastic contrast to the celestial values and divine religions which advocate and endorse the God's love to human being and to live the given life in all its joys instead of putting an end to it for no reason. As a matter of fact, this challenge of refuting the wrong approaches and explanation 
to the religious provisions by extremists and replacing it with right and factual concepts supported by logics and wisdom through stressing on the major positive and bright sides of religions and capitalize on them, aiming at solidifying the pillars of social peace to secure a life full of security and peace. All this was the main incentive and stimulus for organizing this conference, which mainly aims at the com confirmation of the culture of a secure and stable life. Here it comes the paramount importance of the religion and its role in the social peace in general, which will be dealt with by the keynote speakers and researchers through their speeches and research papers and their significant results within the conference nine topics. We, along with Koya University, feel highly proud and privileged to hold this conference the first of its kind in Kurdistan region and Iraq as a whole in terms of a challenging theme of highest significance, which may trigger or stimulate certain levels of arguments, surely constructive or even heated discussions. However, the higher goal of this conference is to firmly adopt the message of coexistence, brotherhood, tolerating, accepting each other, and above all, a full respect of the human beings and their legitimate rights, regardless of their religions, faiths, beliefs, ethnicities, etc. And to regard the human beings of the highest value in accordance with the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Holding this conference at our university campus is of a special uh, significance and of two faults. First, it's our university's first international conference, and second is that the theme of this conference has attracted the intention and interest of the significant number of researchers specialized in this field of knowledge from a wide range of local and international um, communities because of the significant role played by religions and uh, doctrines in the lives of people in various parts of the world. This role had been, in certain circumstances, distorted and manifested, unfortunately, in tragic bloodsheds, victims, and destruction of several years as a result of major faulty concepts, perceptions, and actions by certain groups of people, which is a striking, striking factor for the utmost necessity to correct the destructive concepts mentioned above via an authentic scientific research here it comes, the importance of the conferences dealing with these aspects, and our international conference is one of them. As for our Catholic University in Arbil, this university is not after profit, but after the adoption of serious endeavor to secure a high standard and quality education to guarantee a bright future for its graduates. It also strives to provide an outstanding education atmosphere for its students and faculty members. CUE, on the other hand, embraces basic values of coexistence and mutual, mutual respect and understanding between all components of Iraqi society, meeting thereby its main pillar of its mission. Therefore, CUE welcomes and enrolls Muslims Christians, Yazidis, Mandaean, Kakai, and all other religions and faiths, students without any discrimination in duties and legitimate rights for all of them, reflecting thereby the wonderful mosaic of all faiths in the Iraqi society. On the other hand, and despite all the challenges, CUE is progressing steadily with significant number of ambitious projects to be completed in the near future, let alone a continuous increase in its academic departments and colleges, bearing in mind that our core pillar is our faith in our mission, which is the guarantor to sustain our positivity and optimism about, the, about CUE's future. Sincere gratitude to our esteemed academic colleagues from Koya University, 
for their efforts and also for the wonderful collaboration between the two universities with the conclusion of holding our joint international conference on, the pleasant, on this pleasant day. Our deepest thanks to the CU, CUE sorry, and COIA um, members of organizing and scientific committees for their exceptional hard work and wonderful patience during the past couple of months of preparation. Special thanks goes to all those who supported this conference, in particular, the Religious Freedom Institute uh, in the United States. We appreciate highly and thank tremendously all respected keynote speakers and researchers from different parts of Iraq and from abroad for participating in the proceeding of this conference. Finally, we do hope and look forward for a successful conclusion and best outcomes of this conference with valuable recommendations providing thereby a distinguished service for our society and for the humanity as a whole. Dear guests and participants, your attendance is highly appreciated and we do wish you an enjoyable and fruitful time with us and with the sessions of this conference. To conclude, we wish this conference a great success. God bless you all, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Riyad. Next, I would like to ask our first keynote speaker, Dr. David Trimble, Religious Freedom Institute's Vice President for Public Policy and Director of Center for Religious Freedom to speak about the role of educational institutions to contribute to the development of religious freedom and peaceful and flourishing societies. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the honor of addressing this conference. I am humbled by this opportunity to offer remarks on the soil and amidst the history and tradition of so many who have gone before us as great defenders of faith. Sincere thanks to the Catholic University of Erbil and to Koya University for extending to me this invitation to be with you. This is the second time I've had opportunity to be on this campus and it is such an honor to return after my visit in 2019. Special greetings to my friend Archbishop Bashar Warda, partner in Washington and here to advance religious freedom for all people in Iraq and around the world. I bring greetings from the Religious Freedom Institute in Washington, DC. We are so privileged and honored to participate in this conference, be with you, our esteemed colleagues in this effort. As you may know, our office sits in the shadow of the US Supreme Court as the sun sets across our nation's capital. Our mission at RFI is to promote broad acceptance of religious liberty as a fundamental human right, a source of individual and social flourishing, the cornerstone of a successful society, and as a driver of national and international security, both at home and abroad. We work with a consortium of partners in the United States and abroad to advance policies to help those persecuted for their faith, defend rights of conscience, advance the free exercise of religion, and train today's youth to understand the critical role that religion and religious freedom holds in society. We don't have too much time for me to lay a foundation today, so please forgive me for the fast pace at which 
I will move. I have added a second title to my speech this morning that complements the printed title. And so let me note that title. Prioritizing religious freedom through education, essential to mitigating recurring threats, building peace, and reducing individual and community vulnerability. That's the role of education. If religious freedom is to be restored to its proper place in society, and this is true for American society or Iraqi society, no sector is more central to shaping our culture than the public and private institutions that educate our children and future leaders. But why? Why does religious freedom education stand as the cornerstone of rebuilding religion in society? Well, to answer that question, let's consider for only a few moments today one fundamental aspect of the threats and challenges to religious freedom, whether here in Iraq or in America. One fundamental aspect of the threats and challenges to religious freedom. Let me start at my home in America. Threats to religious freedom are increasing all over America. The attacks come in different forms, but to be sure they are real. Deeply embedded in our culture, and are intended to marginalize the attacks, marginalize or eradicate faith from public life. There are certainly grounds to understand those attacks on religious freedom in America as an assault on moral orthodoxy, an intentional effort to repress religion and core ethics and morals that constitute the free exercise of religion. And that is not wrong. For basic traditional views about life, about abortion, the sacred bond between man and woman in marriage, and God's very creation of male and female are under assault in American culture, more than they've ever been in our history. But I am convinced the issues of our day on our soil while including these fundamental elements of moral orthodoxy, may be rooted in something even more basic. What we see today is a struggle to define reality. And in essence, a conflict between two competing accounts of reality. A reality in which God is relevant and religious truth shapes our understanding of reality over against a reality in which God is not relevant or no longer relevant, religious truth is meaningless, and the dogma of self shapes an understanding of reality. reality. So unlike the painting of the crucifixion by Rembrandt, as he gazed upon the cross. But in that latter description of reality, it is not a transcendent reality of the self, but it is really a supra-individualism in today's perspective that shapes reality. I do not refer, refer here to a slightly exalted sense of self or even what we have called in America a radical individualism. For in both, there is some recognition of finitude. What I refer to here is 
a supra-individualism, a sort of self-apotheosis in which the individual shudders regard for his creator and may take it upon himself or herself to define the limits of life in the womb, the role of marriage and family in society, and even the very nature of human beings. This, unfortunately, is the path of culture and the status of religious freedom even in America today. And it is seen in our courts, in our politics, in our institutions of faith, and even in our schools. It's not my goal to bring you a bleak picture. It's my goal to define reality. And that's the only way that coming together and working collaboratively will return to that cornerstone of religious freedom in our societies. What we find in American culture today is a blatant disregard of our elemental anthropology, a denial of the basic human dignity of every man and woman, boy and girl, formed and shaped in the image of his or her creator. It is the willful rejection of the intrinsic value of the human person that my two predecessors spoke of in their opening remarks. Unfortunately, this is the ideology that carries the culture in America today and represses religion. And we must find our ways in America to deal with that repression, that attack on the intrinsic value of the human person. Here, among friends, and with you, I love walking your soil and meeting you and your people, sharing time on my last trip in northern Iraq and to Hook and the Nineveh Plain and among the ancient churches of all different confessions of faith here, I love your land. My heart goes out to the dear people of Iraq, to all of you for throughout your history, ethnic and religious minority communities have suffered violent attacks, atrocity crimes, and genocides that should never have happened. Consider the attacks in 2014. I need not remind you, and again, the goal is not to be bleak, but simply to look through the lens of reality for just a moment. Consider the attacks in 2014 and the atrocities perpetrated upon minority faith communities the burning and destruction of sources of food for families and, tiny, and, and entire communities like Karamles, in which a hundred plus farmers were left without machinery or crops. When Daesh formed their strategy of coming into northern Iraq, they struck at the vulnerability of individuals and families. They struck at the very heart of what it means to be human, to need food. The burning of the crops was an intentional attack on the most basic meaning of what it means to be human and to need food. It was the earliest form of attack by Daesh, and it was an attack on basic human dignity. Consider the attacks on the schools, the teachers, the students, the very sustainability of education. During Daesh, the vulnerability of individuals and communities was severely heightened by attacks focused on education. 2014, 60 attacks based on a UN report on schools, 2015, 90 attacks, 2016, 11 attacks, 2017, 151 attacks on schools, on education, targeted female educators and girls' education, teachers killed for refusing to teach the curriculum of Daesh. 
schools used as sites to sell Yazidi women, 10 universities subsumed under the control of Daesh. What were the results? Dramatic increase in child labor, child marriage, child recruitment, indoctrination of children through curricula and apps. The intent of Daesh through these attacks was to destroy the human dignity, the human dignity of children, of students, of families, of communities. That was the focus. Strike at a point at which they're valuable and destroy their human dignity. And then, of course, as we know, and I've seen the destruction of homes and forced migration, entire towns plundered like Batnaya, 200 plus IDPs on the doorstep of Erbil, and you took them in. 800,000 plus in camps outside the hook, really searching to find human dignity in the midst of the crisis, all intentionally aimed at creating staggering vulnerability and attacking the intrinsic base core human dignity of every man, woman, boy, and girl. Finally, as you look back through that lens that's so painful to see, the kidnapping and enslavement of women and young girls Many dead, thousands still missing, families ripped apart, constitutes a direct attack on the innate value of the human person. If you study war crimes throughout history and the horrors of religious persecution and genocides in Darfur today in Myanmar and with the Uyghur Muslims in the education camps in the Republic of China, Violent actors begin their assaults by heightening the vulnerability and attacking the base human dignity of the targeted population. Specialists in atrocity prevention in the United States have told me at times that there is no such thing as a vulnerable community. It just isn't so. This is why conflicts that involve religious persecution, atrocity crimes, and genocide are often cyclical. Because the vulnerability that is created by these targeted acts is intended to tear at the very soul of the impacted individuals and communities. And unless there is a way to recover from that vulnerability, unless we find a way forward to help these communities and individuals together in the world recover from that vulnerability, they become part of a cycle that in many times repeats. Now, back to the critical question. Having looked through the lens at America and seeing after 200 years when for the first 100 years we didn't have one contest, one challenge in the U.S. that ever went to our Supreme Court for the first 100 years. But around 1896, up to the present, there's been over 100. They're escalating each year. Summer of 2020, there were four cases alone landmark cases that went to the Supreme Court challenging religious freedom in America. We face challenges in America. And we need your help to know how to face those. And through the lens of focusing here on your home, we want to help you. So the question, why does religious freedom education stand as the cornerstone of rebuilding free exercise of religion and peaceful pluralism in society? Why? 
Let me offer an answer in conclusion with five brief statements, five brief conclusions. One, the solution for religion-based persecution cannot be found in law or politics alone. Both are helpful and necessary tools, but neither provide an effective, an effective medium of rebuilding and affirming human dignity like education. Stay with that train of thought. Education. Education is the incubator of culture and a building block to mitigating the vulnerability of individuals and communities. What is the best way to place a cornerstone back on the lands that were compromised and taken by Daesh and to rebuild communities and return people to healthy life and flourishing to establish the cornerstone of education for every woman, every man, every boy, every girl. Education is that cornerstone. Education is the incubator of culture and a building block to mitigation, to mitigating the vulnerability of individuals and communities. But education or the lack thereof is also the incubator of increasing the vulnerability of individuals and communities. When we don't step up to return, to nurture, that return to human dignity for those that have suffered in our communities and around the world, then the lack of education becomes an impetus for increasing vulnerability in that context. Third, religious freedom education is in fact based on human anthropology. It is rooted in affirming the intrinsic value of the human person or every human person, whether Sunni, Shia, Christian, Jew, Yazidi, or any other faith. Religious freedom is based in that rudimentary basic anthropology that affirms the intrinsic value of every human person ab absent any subjective form of affirmation by virtue of simply being created by God, formed and shaped by our creator. Fourth, Beginning to understand the basic principles of religious freedom from an early age through higher education and beyond affirms the freedom of each person living in community with one another to seek ultimate truth in a transcendent reality and once finding that truth to order his life or her life accordingly. Fifth and last, by affirming and empowering the basic human dignity of each person, religious freedom education may serve as a tool of the state or private sector to foster the flourishing of individuals, promote peace building, and mitigate or overcome deeply pervasive vulnerabilities in society. Friends, academic colleagues, you are equipped through education to do what law and politics cannot do alone. You can help every faith community understand and live within the context of human flourishing and understanding their own human dignity. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. David, for your thoughtful remarks. And now we will be breaking for 20 minutes, and then we will come back for our interesting panels and keynote speakers and uh, presentations. Thank you very much. The coffee break is here.